welcome everyone um, to the Democracy in Action training, which uh, was going to be a live conference at um, in Concord, but we are now um, all home and recording these workshops. Um, so tonight, uh, Isaac, if you just want to hit the next slide, I just want to review a little bit about Zoom. Um, so if you want to mute or unmute yourself, you could see that on the bottom screen. Uh, if you want to turn your video off, that is right next to it. Um, you can see the participants, and when you click on participants, that's where you can raise your hand if you have a question. Or if you have a question, you can chat it. Um, Brian has gratefully put the handouts for this presentation and also where you can find the recording afterwards. Um, if you have joined by phone, which I don't think anyone has, you can hit star six to unmute yourself. Um, during the presentation, um, we will ask everybody to use the chat box and we're going to practice right now by asking everyone to put their name in town um, in the chat box and what brought them to this workshop today. So if you don't mind doing that for us. Where are we doing that? In the chat box. Yeah, and click the chat box at the bottom and you can send a message to everyone. Hi Sophie from Dover and Arnie from Canterbury and Brian from Northwood and I'm here Olivia Zink from Franklin, New Hampshire. Um, Isaac if you just want to go to the next one and, and David from Summersworth, welcome and Regan from Nashua, welcome and Steve from Concord. So today we're going to talk about how we organize um, to build power and move our members to action. We have a wonderful panel, um, Arnie Alpert with American Friends Service Committee, Isaac Grimms with Rights in New Hampshire, um, Louise Spencer of the Kent Street Coalition, and Olivia Zink here with Open Democracy. And go ahead, Isaac. Or actually, Arnie. Let's go to Arnie. Okay, great. So um, it's, you know, the times that we're in right now is not what we were thinking when Olivia and Open Democracy felt like there was time for a Democracy in Action workshop and for us to be talking about how we build power and how we mobilize people for action. So we thought that it would be useful to just kind of help us get grounded in this time that we are in right now. Um, for me, I often find inspiration in the words and life of Dr. King, who in the letter for Birmingham jail said, all people are caught up in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. And I, I think that the times that we're in right now make that more obvious perhaps than it ever was, than it ever was before. Um, but just to say that the issues that bring us together, that motivate our organizations that have to do with justice and injustice, that have to do with building a building actual democracy here, they were with us before the coronavirus and they will be with us after the coronavirus. We're not exactly sure how things will be changed when we get to the other side of this crisis. The situation will be somewhat different. We'll have some new challenges. Perhaps we'll have some new opportunities. But through it all, we never have been and we are not powerless. And there are things that we are able to do to bring about change. And together in community, we can learn from each other and learn together to help us go forward. So I'm glad to be here with you all this evening and looking forward to this workshop. Thanks, Arnie. Um, and thank you, Olivia, for bringing us all together here. Um, so I'm going to run through with everyone the goals for this training and then uh, give space for the trainers ourselves to just introduce ourselves and why uh, we are trainers, like what brings us to, what's our credential here, what brings us into being able to train on how to build power uh, and move folks to action. So um, our goals for today, we want uh, everyone on this call to come away with is one that we are grounded in a shared understanding of power and an analysis of how structural oppression from racism, sexism, heterosexism, the, the many types of uh, structural oppression that are out there um, and all around us, uh, how they're used by the 1% to maintain wealth and power. Um, we want everyone to come away with a clear understanding of what power is, why we need to be building power, um, not just 
solo by ourselves, but in collaboration with people's organizations like Open Democracy, like American Friends Service Committee, like Rights and Democracy, like 10th Street Coalition. Um, and then how, how you can build power. Number three, we wanna provide tools and strategies for how community leaders can move others to take action with you. And number four, that um, we keep in mind that in this moment of social distancing, in this very scary and unprecedented moment of a pandemic, um, that we know that there are still cr critical opportunities for us to use people power to push for political change. Um, hands up if you feel good about those goals, if you're excited to come away with those things with us. All right, great, thank you. So um, I'll briefly introduce myself, and then if the other trainers could do so as well, and then we'll jump right in. So my name is Isaac Grimm. My pronouns are he and him. And my role is that I'm the organizing director with Rights and Democracy New Hampshire. Uh, Rights and Democracy is a bi-state organization in Vermont and New Hampshire. We were founded in 2015, and we are at our core, uh, a member-led people's organization aimed at building progressive power, winning policy change, uh, and building power on the local level with community members directly impacted by the issues that are facing many, many people from poverty to lack of health insurance, lack of decent funding for uh, basic social needs and public goods, uh, and that we are lifting up the voices and leadership of people in our communities so that power is actually directed by those right now who are left out. Um, and that we really like are changing the nature and dynamic of what's possible, what's politically possible within our states as part of a larger national movement. Um, so I've been doing this for about five or six years now as a union organizer and now as a community organizer. I have knocked thousands of doors. I have trained at least hundreds of people. I, don't, I haven't kept count. Um, in, in the basics of community organizing, in canvassing, in direct asks, um, in a lot of these fundamentals, so um, excited to be here with you to go through these things. And uh, why don't we have Olivia go next and then pass it on. Great. Well, thank you, Isaac. And my name is Olivia Zink and I'm coming with you today from Franklin, New Hampshire. Um, I have been a community organizer in New Hampshire for 20 years um, and organizing is the heart of what I love to do most in my life. Over to, to Arnie. Yeah, and I'm Arnie Alpert. I'm the co-director for the New Hampshire program of the American Friends Service Committee. And I've been doing training since 1977, uh, largely in relationship to nonviolent action in its various forms. But over the last couple of decades, I've done a lot more training on political skills, including effective advocacy and also how we can use our opportunities when we get chances to interact with political candidates or office holders. Louise. Hi, um, welcome everyone. So I'm Louise Spencer and I'm the co-founder of the Kent Street Coalition, which is an all volunteer grassroots advocacy organization and um, progressive advocacy organization. We have a working group structure and as such we have six issue-based working groups and also an election action working group um, and we cover a range of issues and we're proud to work in coalition with um, the folks here on the panel and, and many of the other groups across across the state. So thank you. Thanks Louise. Um, yeah, really glad to be collaborating with you all on this um, amazing organizations and I've um, Arnie himself as Arnie and Olivia have both trained me in a bunch of things. So, um, me so too. <laughs> Yeah, um, so just as our, as our preliminary grounding here, um, I think it's important to always keep in mind the context of the world we live in, right? Um, and that context is that we live in a predominantly white state uh, in a country that is founded on what you can call many things, what you could simply call racialized capitalism. Um, it's a system that was founded in the genocide and um, attempted elimination of Native Americans and was founded on the triangle trade based in African slaves being imported into the United States. Um, and those legacies are something that live on in our economy, our culture, our society to this very day. So um, when we're thinking about power, it's a very complicated thing. And all of us come into the world in a different social location based on who we are in that system. Um, and at its core, things like racism, sexism, classism, and the many types 
of oppression that are very real in our society um, have historically been used and are continued to be used as ways for the very small elite that operates uh, pretty much in control of our economy to maintain that status quo and that balance of power. Um, so it's important for us to keep in mind that these things are very real. They sometimes often operate in ways that um, impact the way that we think about ourselves, the way that we treat ourselves and the way that we treat others, and sometimes in ways that we're not even aware of. Um, so there could be, and there is, and are many, uh, entire training series around structural oppression, um, around racism and classism and sexism. What we're gonna really focus on in this training is how we can effectively build power, but we should always be trying to be as open-eyed as possible about the fact that um, we need to be really aware of, the, of like our own privileges um, when we are operating in the public sphere, when we're building power, when we're like seeking to build power to try to dismantle oppression and, and create a society that's more equal. Um, but we also need to realize that uh, those types of racism, classism, sexism, and other things can, can hold us back and stop us from building power, uh, can cause us to actually harm others if we're not being aware of the fact of those, how those operate, and can actually make us lose critical opportunities to build relationships and coalitions with other people. Um, so there's much more we could dive in on, to on that, but I wanted to just keep in mind that um, this is the sort of umbrella reality that we're living under. Um, and it's something that we should always be trying to keep in mind as we're thinking about how we build political power and build power for folks who are not part of the 1%. So with that, I'm gonna move forward. Um, we're gonna have a couple sections here. I'm gonna go into a little bit around what is power uh, that we'll talk about with how we move others to action. Um, we'll have a bit of like Q and A on what is relational organizing? Um, how does that work? And, and kind of share some examples. And we'll go over some examples of like how to do, how to effectively uh, make propositions or, or, or strong asks of other people to bring them into action with us. So with that, I will move forward uh, with just a basic shared understanding here. Like what is community organizing? Community organizing is when there is a group of people who experience a common problem and that they work to you know, think and speak and act collectively to build the power necessary to transform the things around them that are causing this problem, the peop you know, people and the systems and institutions and norms um, that are causing this problem that they're facing. Folks feel good about that definition? Yes. Hands up, so, cool, okay, good. Um, so, oppression and exploitation happen basically because other people who don't share our values have too much power and we don't have enough, put pretty simply. And the reason that we organize is so we can together build enough of our own power to confront, confront uh, those structures of power that are oppressive. And if we're not doing that, if we're not building power, then we're not really on the right path towards making the changes we wanna see in the world. So what is power? How do we build it, right? So just to like, uh, we can, maybe unmute folks, or if there's anybody who'd wanna put in the chat, um, what, do you, what do you think when you think about power? What are some words that come to mind? And you can feel free to throw it in the chat, or if you wanna like unmute for a moment and throw an idea out there. What are some kind of words that come to mind first when you think about power? Influence would be one. Great, good. Money is another I see in the chat. Money. Political, mm-hmm, good, good. Numbers of people, yeah. Good, yeah, awesome. I, th so I think of anybody? power coming from corporate power. Good, yep. co I mean, corporate that, structures. Yep, that is a, a very typical way that we see power build, you know, uh, operating in the world. Yep, absolutely. Uh, knowledge. Good, cool. Threats of okay. violence. Acts of violence. Hmm. Threats, threats yeah. to use violence. Okay. Okay. So, good. All of these things are like uh, uh, very understandable connotations that we have when we think of power. All right. Um, what I've actually, what I noticed here is nobody's actually said like that it's necessarily good or bad. And that's actually, I'm kind of glad to hear that. Um, because we shouldn't think of power, power as inherently good or bad. Power can be used for good or for bad. 
It's just that often we see it being used in a negative way in the world around us um, because of all the background that I just mentioned, right? Um, would anyone want to venture uh, what they would consider, what do you think power is? Your own definition of power. Let's just see what a couple people say. Feel free to throw it in the chat or say it out loud. I think power is the ability to control um, what happens to you. Good. Yeah. Control. Okay. So I'm here. I'm hearing control over yourself, control over what happens to you. Uh, I'm seeing also control over other people. Mm -hmm. Yep. Good. Okay. So, yeah. I mean, if we want to keep it real simple, like power is the ability to act, the ability to do something. In Spanish, it's poder, which means very simply like to be able to. Um, one other way to think about power is like the ability to actually have a vision of the future that you want and to be able to make it a reality, right? And um, so an another way to think about that and the reverse of that is if someone is taking your ability to have a, a actual real vision of the world around you, then they're taking away your power, right? So, you know, marketing that uh, is aimed at making people feel insignificant so they buy stuff, that's like taking away your vision of what the world really is, and that's taking away your power, just one example, right? So when it comes down to it, the way we build power is this just very two simple things. So organizing people, meaning like that you can get people to take action with you, and organizing money. And if you are not doing those two things, you are not building power. Does that sound right to folks? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, so who has power now and how do they build it? Let's think about this. So I heard something from Arnie who said threats of violence, right? There was an example of like how some people build power right now, right? Um, who could name like another person or institution or organization that has a lot of power? And like, how do you think that they're building it? I, um, lies and misinformation are you mm -hmm. propaganda yep. yep that is a big one that's a big one we see it every day uh, if you ever see an advertisement that is pretty much what that is right um, so threats uh, coercion right lies manipulation um, those are some of the kind of negative ways that we see institutions and organizations building power, right? Um, if you don't pay your taxes, what happens? You go to jail, right? There's that threat of violence. Um, seeing a couple chats coming in. Uh, okay, I'm seeing uh, Bernie Sanders has power through empathizing with a large number of Americans. Okay, all right. Yep. Oh. Uh, keeping with my theme in the corporation, threats of um, retaliation, threats of um, uh, um, firing, mm -hmm. that yep. kind of stuff. Good. So why are those not ways that we should build power? Oppressive. Yeah, it's oppressive. I mean, what's the whole point of why we're trying to build power here? Create change. So we can control others? Yep, it's like for control. I mean, I wouldn't mind having a little more control over the 1%, but like, are we really trying to manipulate and lie to others and use coercion and fear? Like, does that align with our values? No, absolutely not. And the I would people... hope everybody would say no, right? <laughs> Everyone on this call. So, you know, we, we, at its core, we have, to, we have to be figuring out ways that we can build power that actually align with our values, right? Our basic values that we hold in common, things like human rights, things like honesty, things like equity, right? Um, so a really crucial... Isaac, can I say something? Go ahead. Uh, I just was going to say that, that there's a word for the people supposedly with our values who have... Uh, operated that way and it's called Stalinism. Uh, cool. Um, 
I didn't quite follow because I'm multitasking here, so I'm just going to keep moving forward. Um, okay, go ahead. So, uh, right. So we would kind of like we can think about some ways that we see powerful institutions and organizations building power, right? Um, some of the typical things: bribery, lies, manipulation, threats, violence, right? What's the way that we want to do it? Um, at its foundation, for us to build power in a way that actually aligns with our values. Um, Relationships is pretty central to that. I would say even more so in a rural state where there's not an endless amount of people, um, relationships are really, really critical to thinking about building power. Um, and we should think about not just moving others to action because we want to use them or because um, we want, just because we want to build power ourselves, just because we want to actually approach it in a way where we invest in real relationships with other people who we want to move to take action with us and that we invest in understanding who they are, where they're coming from, and why they have a vested interest in seeing the same political and social and economic changes that we want to see. So it's about building transactional but transformational relationships, relationships where we are growing and we are helping others to grow with us, um, but where we also get stuff done together. That's the transactional piece, right? And at its core, this has to be rooted in respect for ourselves and for those that we are moving to take action with us and in a shared understanding that we have a shared self-interest in seeing the changes that we want to see in the world and that it's rooted in love. So for me, I, I, I don't go to church, but I view community organizing and I view pushing for political, social, and economic change as a very spiritual practice because it's literally of trying to, to live out the values that I want to see in the world um, in a practical way. So that is, that's the way that I kind of view building power. Um, it has to be rooted in our values. Um, and the way that we treat others around this has to be rooted in those values of love and respect and transformation. So with that, I will pass it back over uh, to Arnie to get folks thinking a little more and diving in a little deeper. Really part of what we're talking about is how do we mobilize people to be able to take action together to change relationships of power. So I'd like everybody here to think about for a moment. Um, this, I don't know everybody who's on this call, but from the people that I know, this is, there's a lot of experience in this room right now. Uh, we're not just, this is not your first time thinking about any of these issues. You've been activists, some people for, for quite some time. So I want you to think about when you got started and think about, maybe the first time or one of the first times that you took action and what was it that got you to take an action and how does that have to do with what did that little story have to do with with power so i'm just going to give one example for myself uh because i remember very clearly when in my first year of college when i learned about the organizing that was going on among farm workers in california and how they had asked people all over the country to boycott non-union grapes and lettuce and gallo wine. And there was a group of people who I knew on my campus who were showing films and educating about this. And on Saturdays, they would go over to the local supermarket and pass out leaflets to encourage people to join the boycott. And that's really the first serious activism I would say that I did. And for me, some of what's important about it was clearly that there were other people who were doing it and they asked me to join. And they were people who I wanted to be with. And the action that we were taking was practical. It was something that we could do and we could see a clear connection between the action that we were taking and the outcome that we were trying to win by putting pressure on supermarkets and putting pressure on the agribusinesses that were exploiting workers in California. So I, for me, that's a, I learned, a, I still draw on what I learned from that campaign for work that I'm doing now. I'm wondering, uh, Olivia, I don't have a, I'm having a trouble getting the gallery view. So I'm wondering if you can help me, uh, if a couple people would raise their hands or one or two people would want to. Billy has his hand up. Can yeah, Billy, do you have a quick story? Um, well, I would say the, the first uh, political cam campaign I worked on was the McGovern campaign. I was 13 years old, I stuffed envelopes for him. I can't remember why uh, I was motivated to do that, but I remember in 68 really liking McCarthy. I was nine years old. Um, 
the anti-war uh, uh, platform probably had something to do with it. Okay. But there was something clear that you, you know, you saw the outcome there. What was going to happen. Um, That's right. So how about somebody else? What's another story? Who's got one? Reagan, go ahead. Oh, we are I'm just going to unmute you. Okay. So, um, so my son had disabilities and he had, you know, when you have a child with disabilities, you realize how little power you have and how dependent you are on the rest of society to help you. And um, I know that my son had a good life because of activists who had come before me um, that worked for people with disabilities. And so if one person could make a difference for him, then why can't I make a difference for somebody else? And so that's why I am. Great. So that's an interesting element. So you knew about other people who had done things uh, mm -hmm. that you could follow in their footsteps. You, weren't, you weren't, didn't have to invent <laughs> things yourself. Yeah. I, 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 I didn't know in the beginning, but I learned as I, once I started to look into it, I was like, oh my God. And there's um, Frida Smith, who's from Salem, New Hampshire, and she closed the, um, you know, she closed the institution in New Hampshire. So the, that's the, one the person. Hospital? Yeah. Yeah, or is, it, or is it the state school? The Laconia State School. The Laconia State School. That's a great campaign, an interesting one to learn about. We got one or two more? I have one. Uh, Michael Peterson. You can hear me okay? Yes, we hear you, Michael. Go for it. When I was young, seventh grade, it was in the 70s or the 60s, I should say, uh, we used to play basketball at the town hall. One day we showed up and the basketball hoop was gone. Mm -hmm. So I wrote a letter to the town council. And wouldn't you know, one day the town fathers showed up at my door. We took a walk over to the town hall. I explained everything. And they ended up putting up the basketball hoop, a spotlight, and a water fountain. And I thought, you know, I didn't know anything, but I appealed to the people who were in power, and they wanted to do the right thing, and they took care of all the kids in town by their response. That's so um, stepping up sometimes yeah. works. It's like stepping up, and sometimes it's very practical. So a lot of these things, there was a particular idea that somebody had and there was something that you could actually do yourself. So that's an interesting thing that when we're thinking about this, that we're asking people to do things that they actually think that they can do, not things that, are, that they would look at and say, that's crazy, that's impossible, and helping people to figure out how to do that. What else might we say just sort of as a generalization if we're trying to mobilize people for action? What would be helpful to make that more possible or to remove some obstacles. One or two other things. And you can feel free to chat. Go ahead, Bob. Nope, um, my, can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay. Um, I go all the way back uh, to John F. Kennedy uh, as an inspiration. Uh, I was a 13-year-old paper boy at the time, uh, delivering two or three morning papers before I went to school. Uh, the country was uh, alive with inspiration. Um, uh, Jackie Kennedy was uh, as influential in inspiring the country. And, uh, you know, I grew up in a uh, political family, not uh, a family of political activism necessarily, uh, but we talked a lot about politics, and uh, that has continued um, to the present. Great. That's great. That's fabulous. I, th I think these examples of politics, obviously, uh, no one is going to diminish the importance of elections and who gets elected and how we all get involved in that right now. That is uh, more apparent to us, perhaps, than ever. But I do hope that as we go on, we continue to think about areas of organizing and areas of power building that are outside that arena of mainstream politics. Because oftentimes that's where real change is also taking place. It's really not just changing who's in control, making the laws, but changing the framework in which those laws or those systems are able to function or keep them from functioning in ways that are oppressive. Uh, Louise, do you want to pick up from here? Sure. Um, actually, if, 
Isaac, do you want to just hit to the next one? I think it's really important when we're trying to organize people to ask them what moves them to action and what they're what they care about. And so all of you just shared some of that, but I other examples are up um, love of country, fear, frustration, but the ability to do something, they're motivated. Um, other individuals are motivated by friends and family inviting them or they're connected to others. So there's lots of different reasons what which move people to action and it's always important to make sure you're asking and being really uh, inviting to understand what, what moves people to action. Go ahead, Louise. Hi. Um, Isaac, I'm just wondering, do you mind um, going off the screen share for a bit, um, taking that down for just now? Thanks. Hi, everybody. Um, again, I'm Louise Fencer. I apologize for the lighting. I, I think I've done most of my Zoom meetings during the day, and, and so <laughs> I've been trying to juggle around with it, but without much success. So um, anyway, I, I was kind of invited by Olivia to share a bit of um, our experience with Kent Street and how we got got going and then some of the the things that we've learned along the way um, I think typically often a move to for people to want to take power is that they're or to take action is that there's something that really awakens them there's something that that happens and they really realize they weren't paying enough attention and that they're now needing to engage and I think as a corollary to that, often there is a sense that um, that there's a feeling of powerlessness and then a need to move beyond that because that's, that's not a comfortable place to be in for a, a long period. And so I think people, sometimes powerlessness, surprisingly, can move people to want to act, um, to move toward action and claim their power. Uh, for Kent Street, the event that, awakened us was the election of um, Donald Trump. And that was waking up November 9th and asking ourselves what happened here. Um, a lot of us just hadn't expected it. And as I said, we realized we really were not paying enough attention. We hadn't been paying attention to what was going on in our own state. Uh, we kind of thought if we could just create, you know, find someone at the top to, um, who shared our values, then it kind of freed us from having to engage and we realized how wrong we were. That really the engagement needs to um, be centered in all of us and that we need to build our power from the grassroots up and from the bottom up and not be expecting that there's someone who's going to come in and just um, make things all better for us. And for, for the folks in Kent Street, that was November 9th was a real wake up call. Um, and after the shock wore off a bit, um, we, my neighbor, John Cunningham, came across the street and said, we have to respond. We have to figure out what we're going to do. And um, our neighborhood has been a close one. Uh, we've, you know, from raising kids to shoveling snow, um, cooking chili, you know, together, and, and we've, we had a lot of a base to start with. We also had done some political work together, done some, some canvassing, had some political forums, um, and so it seemed a natural place to turn, and um, we, we decided that if we were going to survive this, what we perceived as a crisis, that we were going to have to do this in a community uh, with people that shared our values and that would be forward looking and wanting to take action. So John and I walked around the, our neighborhood, which um, John had a very expansive view of our neighborhood and it was an incredibly cold day, it must have been. <laughs> I don't know, it felt like it was below zero. Anyway, I clearly wasn't dressed properly, but he insisted we go to every, every single door and we left the leaflet. And I saw Jim Howard, I, I believe is on here. Jim was up standing on a ladder, um, 
fiddling with a light and and we hadn't met Jim before but we're like here we are we're inviting you to a meeting uh, we want to gather put our heads together figure out how we respond to this moment in time and Jim's been you know part and parcel of Kent Street Coalition from the very beginning um, so initially we did that door-to-door -door, talking with people leaving leaving pamphlets um, if they weren't home and then at our first meeting on December 8th which I believe we share our anniversary with the Monadnock Progressive Alliance. And there's a similar sort of story that they have there. Um, but I had taken all the furniture out of the living room because I had no idea how many people might show up. And I put in as many chairs as I could. And we had well over 50 people come that first night. Um, and it wasn't just the people we had handed flyers out to, it was also friends of friends, people that had heard about it, but generally people who were looking for community. Um, and from there, we've grown to have eight working groups that cover um, you know, a wide variety of topics. There's probably 60 people that are very active in those working groups. We've got a, um, a mailing list of about 250 people that um, take action on a regular basis and our Facebook group which includes people from other groups as well but um, we're just about I think we're three people shy today of the thousand person mark so that's pretty exciting um, so um, if the slide could go up now um, that would be great um, so one second. Oh, there we are. We're <laughs> taking a little break. But um, Olivia, are you doing it now? Is that what happened? Or all right, I'll do it. Anyway, what we found is that people are looking for connection. They're looking for community, and they're looking for shared values as a base from which to act. And they're also looking for effective actions that lead to meaningful and sustained change. So. Some of the lessons we've come away with um, about how to not only move people to action, but to sustain action, because the moving to action is just the first step. And um, a lot of people were moved to, to action in November and December of 2016. The question is, how do you keep people engaged over the long term? Because if we really are going to affect change, it needs to be sustained action. Um, again, we base it on shared values and our goals and actions are value driven. Uh, we invite people to take part. Um, we let them know that they're welcome at any level of engagement. And we let the interest and energies and talents of the group kind of drive, um, drive our work rather than cubbing holing people into what, what we somehow think should, needs to get done. And then we present a menu of options that includes different skill sets, different, um, different amount of time that might be needed. For example, holding a sign versus canvassing, um, looking at different amounts of investment in the organization, again, attending a monthly meeting versus joining a leadership team, um, having these various levels of, um, for people to choose to, to participate, particularly as entry points, is really essential and critical. Um, and then having a ladder of actions as they decide whether they want to become more and more involved and engaged. Um, we try to be really open to the creative ideas that people bring to the table and to recognize the growth potential of every member um, because we recognize that fear often gets in the way for all of us and sometimes people need to really be asked to step out of their comfort zones and they need to be asked that directly at the same time that people are recognizing the potential in, in that person and asking them to, to really tap into that potential and rise to that potential. But if you do that, then it seems to us that it's really important to offer tools and support so that people are successful when they're taking that next step. Um, we go from there to look for and identify leadership potential and we operate on a model of distributed leadership. I can't highly recommend enough, although most people here have probably read it, um, Rules for Revolutionaries, it came out of the Bernie Sanders campaign, their distributed 
model of the campaign. Um, and it, it has guided our thinking at Kent Street tremendously. Um, we appreciate all different levels of engagement and we're very explicit. So from our mission statement, we, we say we understand that each of us brings varying degrees of time, availability, experience, knowledge and skills, and that all are necessary and all are valuable. And that it's the shared resoluteness in our hearts that's the, the critical foundation of our work. Um, again, it's, it's connecting people together and connecting their actions together into a more coherent whole. Um, we found that talk only goes so far that really the thing that keeps people engaged and sustained is having action, but it has to be meaningful action. Um, it can be small steps as long as people see how that's connected to moving and affecting change, um, then, um, then it's, endowed, it's imbued with meaning and people are likely to continue engaging. Um, so it's this need to always connect the action to the bigger picture um, and to, to weave it into a story and into the movement ultimately. Um, and finally, to, to really have that sense of connectedness, I think it's important to root and ground any work that we do in our individual organizations with coalitions and other groups that are, are have, share values and goals. And particularly for an organization like ours where we don't have tremendous diversity, um, we tend to be um, an older, retired, mostly white, um, middle class to upper middle class demographic. It's imperative on us to try to reach out to coalition groups to um, make sure that we're joining in on a, agendas that are not set by us, but that are set by the most impacted uh, people. Um, and we do, that's part of what we try to do. Um, and then finally, I would say that we, we really stress that life and circumstances change and that people need to be able to feel like they can move in and out of the work and that the invitation to join the work is not a one, one time thing. Like you either accept it and you do it or you lose the opportunity. It's really creating an open invitation. Uh, you're always welcome. Yes, please come in. Even if I haven't seen you for six months, I'm thrilled to see you again. Please be here, please join us, we need you. Um, and then finally, I don't know people in Kent Street who join the work to, to get thanked, um, but thanks does go a really long way, as does recognition. Um, and it, it can be just very simple, but, but people like to be seen and they like to feel that they, they're noticed. Um, and then, they love to have their pictures taken and to see themselves show up on Facebook. Um, it's just, you know, it kind of confirms that they're part of something larger. And I find people like to wear buttons. In fact, I haven't worn mine now for about six weeks. Um, maybe not quite that long, but I was sick for a while and, you know, being virtual, I don't think to put it on, but it helps remind me that I'm connected to, to an amazing community um, that I draw as an organizer that I draw tremendous strengths from. So, thank you. Thanks, Louise. Um, oh, again, I'm sorry, I just wanna to speak to the collage for a moment, I forgot to do that. But um, this is just an example of some of the types of, of things that the menu of options that we do offer, you know, anywhere from holding signs at the State House, some folks traveled to, to Homestead, uh, we do tabling, testifying, um, you know, our, our graveyard of Sununu's vetoes. There's so many, there's such an array of things that people can do together to affect change. So thank you. Thanks, Louise. Um, so Olivia, you're taking on the next part. Go ahead, and, you wanna go ahead and advance the slides. The next thing we're really wanting to talk about is how do we build relational power and relational organizing? And, and so I'm gonna, there's a 
uh, several questions on the screen. You know, why does building relationships matter? And so if you could chat in or now I'm going to call on people, David Holt, why does building relationships matter in organizing? David. <laughs> uh, building relationships matter because uh, uh, we're stronger together. Um, and there's a lot of different skill sets out there. Great. Thank you. When we think about what does what sustains action. Um, Arnie, do you want to take what sustains action? It's related to what David just said. I think that community is essential. Uh, that we're we are in this together and that if we're working with other people that helps a great deal i also think if we see that we're moving somewhere if we're if we've got a goal if we the more that we're able to see that the actions we're taking are helping us get there even if sometimes the the in the short term it can be very frustrating but that can also help us keep going we also want to think about what you know we have to meet people where they are because they, some of them might not be able to come to Concord and stand at, with Kent Street. Some might uh, just be learning about what is organizational power and how they build it. Um, to the next question, how do we recognize our own skill? I see a chat from Brian. Um, so you can either chat answers to these questions or feel free to raise a hand. Okay, hey, well then I'm gonna ask Louise, how do you recognize your skills and build leadership? You kind of spoke to that already. Um, so for me personally as an organizer, how do I do that? Mm -hmm. um, partly, you know, I, I rely a lot on feedback from other people and I, and I try to, to really be open to hearing um, what, is, what is effective. Um, in, the, in the things that I am doing. And um, that, that's a big piece. Um, and in terms of, um, and, and there, you know, there's sometimes you can just feel that, that what you're doing is connecting with people and, and then you try to do a little more of that. Um, and then in terms of building leadership, it's also, it's recognizing that potential in other people, even when they're not seeing it in themselves and giving people opportunity to, to do things and not, not just in the way that you think they should be doing it, but, but to really meet the person and say, you know, gee, I, you know, you're, you're really great at writing letters to the editor. You have a, you're really gifted with, um, you know, language and, and have you thought about testifying? Um, and, you know, the person says, no, 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 I couldn't possibly do that. And then helping to explore that with them and see if that's something that, that might, work and they may say no that's not what i could do but you know i could see doing um amping it up to a my turn piece or something like that so so i i think it's um both recognizing potential um but really listening to to the person that you're working with um and recognizing the leadership needs in your own organization i think is critical great and uh, the, the next question about how we support kind of goes into what Brian was chatting. So Brian, you want to pipe in about how we support others to take action? Well, right. I mean, it's great to have community, um, but th that community needs to be led and by, you know, good, if, if you're mm -hmm. developing good leadership who gives, who, may, who paves the way for those, um, the members of that community. Okay. I'm going to ask Heather, you know, why do we value other movement leaders? Just calling on people now. Beware, you might be next. <laughs> hey, what was the question? Sorry. How I do you other value things going on. leaders and how they move people to action? Oh, oh, for so many reasons. I mean, every leader has uh, different skills and you can learn from other leaders. I guess that would be probably a really big one. Um, and they also draw different types of people, like everybody has different personalities. 
Um, we have two people by phone, so I don't know who, who you are, but if you want to introduce yourself and sort of talk about, you know, what moves, how do you sustain action? I'm sure if our phone users want to add something. How do they I don't do know. That? Can you hear me? My name is Ann Podlipney. I don't know if I'm muted or came through. We can hear you, Ann. What's that? We can hear you. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> uh, well, the question, I didn't have an answer yet. I just wanted to make sure I could be heard. Um, well, what sustains you? What moves you to action? And how do you recognize, what, what, what inspires you? Uh, uh, honestly, my own uh, individual interests are uh, inspiring to me and also the fact that I can get together with groups like the ones who are represented here and that really is uh, tremendously motivating because you leave even a meeting like this and you think ah there's the work let's keep moving it forward so the get-togethers with people like yourselves are very important and then again I just have my own uh, particular interest which you all support um, and going back to that question of when did you first get involved, the fellow who spoke about the McCarthy campaign, I remember that as well. That was the first time that I went door to door. And prior to that, I went door to door with my mom when she went around the neighborhood uh, in trying to support Adley Stevenson for uh, president way back then. So it's been a long uh, it, it's been many years, and it just sort of becomes a way of life and, and an outlook on life. And you try and pass it on to the next generation as best you can, and then they, they become active as well. Great. Arnie, how do you practice relational organizing? I think it's... Um you know, from a Quaker perspective, Olivia, there's an idea that everybody's got light within. So I think one of the things that's important here is to assume that anybody that you meet might have something to contribute. And also another thing to do is to try to find common ground with people. I try to respect their ideas, respect who they are, but think about the possibility that we might be able to go somewhere together. And that can certainly, that can certainly help. You never know who in the circle might have the idea that's going to be the one that everybody goes, oh, that's it. Yeah, thanks for that, Arnie. I'm wondering if um, Isaac might just touch briefly on the, the, um, this idea of one-on-one, one-to-one, -on -one, one, one you know, as a way of building relational organizing. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll, I can dive in on that a little bit. Um, so thanks everybody for your input on this. Uh, I, there's, you know, a lot of experience and knowledge and, and good ideas, just, you know, not only from the folks that are the trainers here, but from everybody that's on the call. So appreciate everybody sharing and for, for being together with us. So um, to dig in on this a little bit, right? Like relational organizing and one way to think about it is, is the track I'm gonna go down here around uh, one-to-ones as a tool to build relationships, to move others, to take action with you in a way that's transformative in a way that is sustainable. So um, as, as I said earlier, this is especially important in rural places um, that we are bringing people into the movement with us for the long haul um, and that we're approaching this as a way that's thinking about organizing as relational, not just, um, you know, for one election cycle or for one campaign, um, but that's rooted in community and rooted in relationships. Um, so just to like expand a little bit on that, like what is relational organizing? Um, it's about inviting people to tell new and fuller stories about their lives, um, moving people from self-isolation and self-blame to seeing the larger structures and, and seeing that they have agency and that they, they can be a part of changing those systems. Um, that, um, our own experience is central to our own understanding of the world around us, um, especially when our experience does not add up to the messages that we're receiving from the political establishment or from marketing. Um, and relational organizing, is a, it's about building connections, it's about bringing people out of isolation, especially important right now, um, 
And it's, it's about knowing that we can't do anything really by ourselves. We can't do it alone. We are social beings and power is not an individual thing. It's a collective thing. Um, so it's inviting people to, to move with us and to grow with us. Um, it needs to be grounded in empathy. We should be approaching um, early relationships with people in a way and thinking about one-to-ones as a tool um, for, for like actually effectively really investing in relationships. And we do that by listening more than we talk. Um, being radically curious, um, even taking risks with questions that we would ask people that gets beyond just staying on the surface. Um, and when we do that, we can really get to the stories behind why people care about what they care about, why people are facing uh, struggle in their lives. Um, then we can help, you know, affirm for people that these experiences, um, that, that they're not their fault and that they're not in isolation and that there are, these are common threads, um, from an exploitative economy, right? Um, and that this is all part of helping move folks from blaming themselves or blaming other individuals to, to realizing that there are systems that we can change and that we have to hold those systems accountable. Uh, this is all about stories, right? Stories are so important, especially, yeah, especially now when facts matter less, which is a sad thing, but a, a true thing, right? But also people, I think, are moved more by human connection, by story, um, than they are by large you know, statistics. Facts are super important. We should not throw them out the window, but we need to realize that people are really, really motivated um, by their heart. Um, so we need to think about like, what are the stories that we're receiving? Um, are they actually helping us or are they harming us? Do they match up with what we know is true in our lived experiences? And then we need to know that like our stories and the stories that we can help other people articulate are central to us changing the narratives around us um, and to helping change minds and um, just change the stories that other people tell about the world around them. Um, so you can't build a transformational relationship with an email. You can't with a text. You can't with a Facebook argument. You get the picture, right? So one-to-ones is a way to think about building transform transformational relationships. And a one-to-one is it's just really, it's a natural but an uncommon conversation with someone who you wanna know better so you can understand their values, their vision of the world around them, of themselves, what motivates them, what they want to accomplish. Um, so they're, and you know, I would say they're like the most effective first step we could take in building power um, and getting folks to work with us and organizing more people into a movement with us, into a campaign with us, into the long-term progressive movement with us um, in a way that aligns with our values. Uh, so the goals of a one-to-one -one is building a public relationship meaning uh, not just, you know, your family or your best friend that you hang out with, right, but someone who you have a relationship with based on shared interests, shared values, and shared goals in the public arena. Um, it's about building trust. So in the future that you can hold each other accountable, right? If you are working together towards a goal, you have to have trusting relationships so that you can help move each other forward and be real with each other uh, when you're not moving forward and, and help figure out what's holding you back and what, what is holding others back. Um, it's how we uncover people's core issues that matter to them, their story, what is their self-interest. Um, it helps a person you're talking with get clarity themselves about what's like, why they're, why they care about the issues they care about, what their story is, what they, what their vision is for the power they can build. A lot of people don't get asked those kinds of questions. So these can help other people build a lot of clarity for themselves. Um, and you can learn a lot more about your community, uh, the power dynamics in the community, um, and just, uh, yeah, just in general, you can learn a lot. Um, so a good one-to-one -one takes courage, takes curiosity, and non-judgment is super important. We are not, you know, sitting down with people to get to know them and their stories so that we can call them out or shut them down or tone police them. This is about really being non-judgmental. And um, ways to think about going about this. Normally, if we were able to sit down with people, you'd want to sit down face-to-face. Now you can do it over a video call. Um, and ideally something you schedule in advance, you really spend time asking follow-up questions. So if you just ask someone like what issue matters most to them um, and they say healthcare, for example, you know, you wanna ask follow-up questions to like understand why, why does that issue matter to them, right? And like really just seek to understand what is the story behind that opinion? What's the story behind that feeling? Um, so a lot of why questions. And it should be like you listening 70% of the time at least. Um, and then it's important to take notes afterwards. If you want to build relationships with a lot of people, 
um, sometimes we forget some of that important stuff. So we should keep track of who we're getting to know and what's important about them so that when we're following up with them later, we can look back at that and be like, oh, right, this was this amazing thing about this person, right? Because there's so much going on in our lives. It's easy to forget things. Um, so taking notes can be really helpful. Um, let me make sure I'm not forgetting anything that's after that. Um, yeah, so that's the kind of at its core, how we can think about building those deeper relationships with folks to like invest in the relationship before we ask anybody to take action with us. Um, you know, understanding that like, there's, you don't, not going to always have time to have one-on-ones with every single person that you want to, but it can be a really powerful way, um, to approach building power and approach getting others to take action with you because it will sustain you. Uh, it will help you sustain your relationships and it will make whatever ways that you're moving people to take action with you. You'll know how to approach it in a much more powerful way than just saying, Hey, you care about this thing. Will you do this thing with me? Will you make this phone call or will you phone bank? Right? Like you'll have a lot more success in moving people to take action with you. So, um, from there, uh, just any questions or any feedback or any kind of thoughts or feelings that are rising up from what I just laid out there for folks. Isaac, I have a question. It's Brian. Sure. Um, so uh, do you find that you have a lot of people in your group? Do you call them intentionally like once a month? or once every couple of months, just call them up and have a chat. Um, not necessarily about any particular business. Is that a worthwhile effort? Is that something that's part of that maintaining that relationship? Yeah, so uh, th that got me thinking a little bit. Um, a one-to-one -one is sort of like, that's one way to think about like your first time of really getting to know someone and going deep with them. And then when you're following up with someone, it's a little different, you know? I mean, it's not like you need to dive all the way in every month with people, but like you should have a solid understanding of um, what matters to that person and why and what they want to accomplish um, and what they're good at and what they want to, you know, get better at and, you know, what can hold them back. So then that just helps inform your follow-up conversations with people as you're working together with them in whatever capacity. Um, but I do try to, you know, I, I definitely try to approach any follow-ups with, you know, whether it's staff or with, um, with leaders of not just like calling them up and saying, Hey, this, you know, this thing, <laughs> this thing we need to happen, blah, blah, blah. Like actually remembering that that's a person and that I care about them and I want to see how they're doing. So, you know, it, it's a balance. Um, but it, it, if you actually have that deeper conversation in the beginning and then you understand more about that person, it can help inform, um, the ways you're following up with them as you're taking action together. Um, can I just add a little bit to that? Um, so as Ken Street is in the process of kind of, as we all are assessing how we move forward in this time, and we have our convener group, which is our leadership team is about um, 18 people. And we've been having these sorts of Zoom meetings. Um, but I, I just recently went this week, I called each of the, the conveners individually and had really extended conversations with them, both about how they were doing, but also how they're envisioning um, Kent Street moving forward and what our work might look like right now. And we had had those conversations in a group setting, but to really have that opportunity to hear people expand upon their ideas. So it, there was so much richness in that and so many new thoughts that came out um, and new ideas um, that I think that moving, regardless of, you know, the, the one-on-one, -on -one as Isaac's saying, is the, for bringing people in or maybe moving them up the ladder, but, but it's important, I think, not to forget with people who are kind of solidly in the organization, whether it be staff or longtime volunteers, that those really one-to-one -one conversations really matter a lot. Great. So Isaac, do you want to just advance the slide real quick oh, or maybe one more? One of the things, one-to-one -one is one tool about how to build power. And a lot of times one-to-ones, if you want to just advance um, again. 
Uh, yeah. Um, so one of one technique um, when you're moving people to action is you really have to make an ask. Um, and oftentimes when you make an ask, just will you do something for me? Um, it's not as effective as if you follow this formula. And I have seen this formula play out and it's really a, a, a tool or a technique to really help you build calm and get ground. Tell your story, how you've been successful in doing that. Tell people that, that these actions are part of a larger plan before you make an action. And by following these few steps, and really it's like one sentence for each, you know, understanding and respecting somebody's values and what moves them to this work, having a, a quick story, either story of yourself or story of the organization, how, you, how this is, you've built success by doing these actions um, really does help um, make it a more effective ask when you're, when you're asking people to, to take, to take action. Um, and with that, I do, do, I know we're running close to the end of the training, but I want to, we were going to model this, but I think it's more important that we open it up for questions on anything that anyone said throughout the training. Can, can we go from the shared screen then to the, sure. The full view. Yeah. Go. Good. Uh, just, just real quick, and maybe it'd be interesting to just hear. Like, has anyone had an experience where someone asked you to take action that wasn't effective, and you were like, "Nope." <laughs> has anyone ever had that happen? Lots of people are. In, so, just unmute yourself if you wanna, or raise your hand. Bacon. Well, I had someone ask me to help with an action and um, it was really an unpleasant experience and they weren't, uh, it wasn't effective at all. They hadn't put in the planning and considered the timing of when the action was and everything. And it was, um, it just made me not want to work with them again. So I think it's important to make sure that you're asking someone to be involved in something that's, you know, even if it doesn't go without a hitch, at least it's, um, you know, like a shared experience. I felt like um, this person um, didn't really take responsibility for the way it turned out. So I just think it's important to hold yourself accountable as well as other people. Yeah, and, and try and put yourself in the shoes of people that you're asking to move with you, right? And yeah. understand like, is this going to make sense for this person or not? Um, and that comes from actually knowing something about that person. <laughs> yeah. Um, as and it, Regan, I'm, I imagine you've had you know a kind of opposite experience where there's been really positive asks. Um, so if you'd want to yes. share anything like that, or or if anyone else would want to share an example of you know someone who is who's done it the right way. Well, I mean, you know, there's been so many experiences that I've had where I've had I've met so many amazing people and felt like I'm doing good, and and I leave whatever it is feeling like. Um, feel like I accomplished something, even if there's not really a completely direct action, even if you can't see something change overnight, it's still something that I feel that being there changed me. So in that way, a lot of different things have been beneficial to me. I had someone recently ask me if I would help lead a training workshop and I said, yes. But you can think about it, it actually made sense. There was a relationship, we knew each other, she had a sense of what she thought I could bring to this perhaps, um, that this was something that I might be willing to do. Uh, and that if I had time, that there would be something that I could do that I could bring to it. So I, I think I'm in Olivia's funnel somewhere. <laughs> and um, we'll, we'll share the image of the funnel out to everyone because it is really kind of helpful to think about like when you are approaching asking someone to take an action with you that you that you preface it in ways that help set context for the person that helps set meaning uh, and it's a sense of a shared goal and what they'll be accomplishing together with you. Um, so that is really helpful. So we'll make sure that everybody gets a copy of that. So you can kind of refer to that before you are, are thinking about making an ask of someone. And the recording of this and the handouts will be on a web page that we will email you all um, as well. 
Um, and I do want to invite you to join us on Saturday um, for three more amazing workshops. Jerry King, who's with us, and Steve, who's also here with us today, um, will be leading our workshop Saturday morning at 9 a.m., again, using Zoom, um, and to talk about how to manage volunteers, how to facilitate, and really what are the core components of how we build teams together. So we invite you all also to join us on Saturday. Jim, do you, did you want to add anything, Jim? No. no. Giving a thumbs up. See you then. <laughs> See you then. I want, to just, I want to say a word about the importance of hope and vision here. Because when we think about what motivates people, a lot of us, uh, we've got a lot of fear right now, which is justified. We might have some anger, which is justified. We've got some frustrations, which is justified. We've got some feelings like it's pretty difficult to dig out of some of the holes that we're in right now. Um, and some of those can help people be motivated in the short term, but I don't think that motivation that comes from fear, that comes from anger is going to last. So if we are able ourselves to find some hope and be thinking about our own vision, if we think about the, the song Eyes on the Prize and try to put that into practice and keep ourselves looking over the horizon at things that are, may not seem possible right now. And if we can do that, and then if we can help other people do that as well, I think that we will get further on our, our path toward the world we're trying to create. Thank you, Arnie. Just to add to that very briefly, um, I, I know that all of us are experienced this are experiencing the same struggles of isolation right now. And um, it can be hard to see past that. Um, but we should just keep in mind that we are part of a movement of millions of people across the country that is incredibly diverse and incredibly motivated um, and incredibly powerful. And, uh, you know, pretty soon we'll be able to meet each other again face to face, but we should just keep ourselves you know, grounded in the fact that like we are in this together. There are people in this struggle across the country who have the same goals as us and the same values as us. And um, even up in this corner of the United States, we can be part of a really powerful movement that can, um, that can dictate what's going to happen for future generations. And so we have a lot of people who are there with us and who are pulling with us, even if we can't see them every day. There's an amazing community within, um, in New Hampshire that, you know, is represented here tonight in this virtual room. Um, and it, it really encourages and inspires me to see, as I look out on the faces, that's one reason I really wanted the full screen because it, I really value seeing each one of you. Um, and even those who don't have their faces up, it's still, it's just very nice to know even here right now we're in we're in community together and this is what is going to sustain us hello oh good to see you um and Anne, right hi um and i think arnie's mentioning eyes on the prize one of the things i've learned from arnie is the importance of music and um as keeping us um inspired and hopeful and and you know, I think we're seeing a lot of that across the world right now as people throw up in their windows and sing out. Um, and it's an effort to reach out to one another in a really fundamental way. And that's what we're doing together as organizers. So. Hey, if everybody can um, just like make a, make a, like a hands up or excited face or something, we do a screenshot and just get a, yeah. everybody yeah. here. So just like put them up. Thanks, <laughs> <laughs> Isaac. Got him. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Thank you all so much for being with us today. And we will uh, make sure to stay connected and hope we see you again on Saturday morning.